year was 1674. In the private theater of Tsar Alexei, the tale of the Byzantine princess Bulkaria was being retold. Long ago, she had been the elder sister of a Byzantine emperor, a seven-year-old boy given to daydreaming. So she ruled in place of her little brother and proved to be wise and fair. The tale delighted its royal audience, but one teenage princess, Sophia, was spellbound. This was her own dream brought to life on stage. She had no idea where and how far that dream would lead her. Two years later, when Tsar Alexei's eldest surviving son took the throne as Fyodor III, the house of Romanov seemed secure and stable. The succession was not in dispute. Alexei himself had named and blessed Fyodor as his successor from his deathbed. There was one thing, though, that worried the people. The young Tsar had had to be carried to his coronation in a litter. He could barely walk on his own. As Fyodor ascended the throne, many at court openly hinted that the young Tsar was not long for this world. Chapter 1. Fyodor III Alexeyevich. Fyodor had suffered from chronic scurvy since childhood. It led to anemia, a blood disorder that left him profoundly weak. It also caused his limbs to swell and led to the abnormal development of his bones and cartilage. Scurvy is caused by an acute deficiency of vitamin C. In the 17th century, it was common during wars or long sea voyages. The first Romanovs, however, seem to have had a rare hereditary form of the disease. Because of his ill health, Theodore was forced to spend much of his time indoors, unable to take part in games or sport. Instead, he developed an interest in the sciences. His tutor was the philosopher and poet Simeon Polotsky, and Theodore was extremely well educated for his time. The young Tsar excelled in theology, philosophy, rhetoric, and poetry. He spoke fluent Polish and read Ovid in the original Latin. Fyodor owned a large music library, sang well, and was a talented composer. But his greatest passion was for horse breeding. When Fyodor was only three, he was not given a toy horse like most other three-year-olds, but a real horse, because he was the son of a Tsar. The little boy was in awe. For the rest of his life, he would be obsessed with everything to do with horses. Theodore's parents hoped that riding would improve the prince's health. But instead, their worst nightmare came true. One of his father's friends, we are noble Artemon Matviev, witnessed the accident. When he was 13, Fyodor decided to travel to the countryside by sledge, along with his aunts and sisters. He was given a hot-tempered horse to pull the sledge, which he mounted. But there were so many people in the sledge that the horse couldn't move it. It reared, threw the rider off, and he fell under the sledge. It ran over Fyodor Alexeyevich with all its weight and crushed his chest. Fyodor survived, but to add to his woes, he suffered chest and back pain for the rest of his life. Fyodor was an enthusiastic follower of the latest European trends. He wanted to be a reformer, to sweep away all that was outdated and backward in Russia, and bring in all the latest fashion and innovations from the West. 
but his illness left him effectively sidelined, a virtual prisoner in his own palace. Control of government fell into the hands of the Tsar's uncle, Ivan Miloslavsky, and his family. His rival, Artemon Matvyev, a brilliant diplomat and sworn enemy of the Miloslavsky clan, was sent into exile. Under the young Tsar, power once more lay with the Boyar nobles. Miloslavsky dismissed the Department of Secret Affairs and the Department of Accounting, the former instruments of royal government. He himself took over two key government departments, the Great Treasury, which controlled state finance, and the Department of Ambassadors, in charge of foreign policy, as well as other minor departments. Other departments were distributed amongst his friends and relatives, some of whom held up to half a dozen different government posts. In just a few years, the number of government departments increased from 42 to 60. The total number of bureaucrats rose from 882 to 2,762. This new bloated administration was riddled with corrupt and lazy officials, many of whom owed their place to the Miloslavsky family. was love at first sight. On Palm Sunday, during the celebration of Christ's entry into Jerusalem, a solemn procession bearing icons and a crucifix crossed Red Square and entered the Kremlin Cathedral. Amid the crowd, one girl caught the eye of the 18-year-old Tsar. She stood out less for her beauty than for her proud and noble bearing. The Tsar was captivated. The girl was found. Her name was Agafia Grushetskia, the daughter of a petty nobleman who now lived with her uncle in Moscow. Fyodor instructed the uncle to keep his niece safe and not allow her to marry without his permission. But the Tsar's choice of bride did not suit the Miloslavsky family. They wanted him to marry a girl from their own family, not the daughter of some impoverished provincial noble. Fifty years later, the historian Vasily Tatishev investigated the facts and reported. Ivan Miloslavsky slandered Agafia in front of the Tsar, claiming that both she and her mother were known to be guilty of several obscene acts. But the girl found out about this unjust accusation and when questioned by officials, declared that no one should be in any doubt as to her honor and swore to it on her life. Reassured by this news, the Tsar decided to pay a secret visit to his chosen one. He took a trip through the hills outside Moscow so on his way back, he could pass by Agafia's house as if by accident. Agafia's relatives told the girl to stand in the window. And for the first time, their eyes met. Theodore took the first independent decision of his life. The scheming and deceitful Ivan Miloslavsky was dismissed from court. He was no longer welcome in the Tsar's presence. To respect tradition, a formal presentation of bridal candidates was arranged for the Tsar. But everyone knew the name of the winner before the contest even began. The Tsar, the candidates, and the organizers. But it was unthinkable to overlook the ancient custom. Fyodor, now 19 and married, was at last recognized as having reached his majority and assumed the full authority of the Tsar. Now, he would take control of his own fate and push forward his own ideas on how Russia should be governed. His first act was to summon all the nobles of the realm, the most senior nobles, the boyars, his advisors, the Okalnichi, and the members of the council. They were to meet at one o'clock to begin the work of reform, beginning with taxation. 
To support the Tsar's standing army, a variety of small taxes were replaced with a single new tax. Every household was now expected to pay 90 kopecks per year, the equivalent of 72 kilograms of grain or 26 kilograms of beef. Because of the acute shortage of cash, the Tsar sold the rights to collect this tax to tax farmers, helping to quickly replenish the treasury. By 1680, state revenues totaled more than 1.2 million rubles. Customs and excise duties accounted for 53% of revenue. Direct taxation raised 44% and other minor taxes accounted for the remainder. Next came a population census. Completed in 1678, it identified 5.6 million people living in Russia. But this only included taxpayers in the heartland regions. If non-taxpayers were added, plus those in new settlements on the fringes of Russia and across Siberia, as well as the Cossacks, the total population was approximately 12 million. This made Russia one of the world's most populated countries and largest in terms of territory. By the end of the Romanov dynasty in 1917, this population had grown eightfold to 103 million. Next was boundary reform. Existing boundaries were checked and new ones established, settling disputes over land ownership and fixing the boundaries of private estates, royal estates and church lands. Next, army reform. The most settled parts of Russia were divided into nine new military districts. From now on, every regiment was tied to one of these districts, was stationed there and did its recruiting there. 20 years later, this system would be the basis for even more sweeping reforms by Fyodor's younger brother, Peter the Great. To help fight injustice, the Court of Petitions was reopened. A person of any rank or position could file a complaint to the Chamber of Judgment and to the Tsar personally. When Fyodor heard that some petitions compared the Tsar to God, he was indignant. He said that it was indecent to write such words, and that if anybody dared to write again in that style, he would not regard their petition with favor. Tsar Fyodor also reformed the penal code and abolished a range of barbaric punishments, including the cutting off of hands, feet, and fingers. Prisoners who would have received these punishments were now sent to Siberia instead, where they helped to settle and develop the vast, empty lands that lay beyond the Ural Mountains. Moscow, a city built of wood, used to be destroyed by fire about once every generation. In the reign of Tsar Fyodor, large parts of the city were rebuilt in stone for the first time. The state treasury offered 10-year interest-free loans to pay for the work. The Tsar would personally visit the site of fires to see the loans issued. Most of these medieval mortgages were never repaid, but they helped to build 10,000 new houses, creating a new city of stone. Finally, the system of precedence, by which the Boyar nobles could inherit government posts by virtue of rank alone, was abolished. From now on, appointments would be based on merit and the Tsar's judgment. Those, as it was put, whom the great sovereign indicates. The Tsar solemnly burned the great books of rank, which catalogued the pedigree and precedence of all Russia's noble families, in a great bonfire in the courtyard of his palace. The Tsar had ushered in a new age, in which good government took precedence over the boyar's ancient privileges. Tsar Fyodor was a man in a hurry. He introduced Polish fashion at court. Some courtiers even began to shave their beards. He encouraged the founding of Russia's first university based on European lines. He built a fortress at Izium to guard the southern border against Tatar raids and opened the first state almshouses in Russian history. He began work on reforming the courts. Sometimes it seemed his illness had deserted him but it never entirely left him. Theodore knew it was a race against time and there was much work to be done. War in the south against the Ottoman Turks and Crimean Tatars proved costly. 
It was a conflict that might have been avoided with the help of Artemon Matveyev, the Tsar's most experienced diplomat. But for now, he remained in exile. In 1677, a 100,000 strong Crimean Turkish army invaded Ukraine. It was met by a Russian-Ukrainian army with a strength of 57,000 men. Despite being outnumbered almost two to one, they managed to repel the Turkish invader. The following year, a Turkish army 200,000 strong was defeated by a Russian army of 120,000. But Russian generals were unable to capitalize on these victories. In 1681, the Treaty of Bakhchisarai was signed between Russia, the Ottoman Empire, and Crimean Khanate. Eastern Ukraine and the city of Kiev remained in Russian hands. The Dnieper River became the new border with the Ottomans, while a buffer zone was created between the Dnieper and Bug River. The war had exhausted the Tsar, but with peace, his health began to improve. What's more, his beloved queen, his Tsaritsa, was pregnant with their first child. The baby was expected that summer. But their happiness was not to last. There were complications with the birth. Agafia died three days later, on July 14, 1681. Their infant son outlived his mother, by just six days. Fyodor was thrown into despair. His always frail health now began to deteriorate with alarming speed. Fyodor knew he needed an heir to ensure a peaceful succession when the time came. And seven months later, he married again. This time, his bride was a 14-year-old girl named Marfa Apraxina. Theodore did not even have the strength to stand during the wedding ceremony. Just 10 weeks later, he was dead at the age of 20. His final decline was so rapid, he didn't have time to leave instructions about his succession. Theodore had the potential to become Russia's first enlightened monarch, to lead Russia into the main current of European civilization. He had everything that was required, education, determination, character, everything, except health. Tsar Fyodor III ruled Russia for just five years, but in that time he created the basis for one of the strongest armies in the world, introduced a system of social welfare, reduced taxation, expanded the borders of his realm, transformed Moscow from a city of wood into a city of stone, and laid the foundations of a secular system of education. He approved the foundation of Russia's first university, but died before he could sign the charter. Fyodor's death paved the way for a power struggle between two boyar families. The Miloslavskis, relatives of Tsar Alexei's first wife, the late Tsaritsa Maria, and the Narushkins, the family of Alexei's second wife, Natalia. The Miloslavskis candidate for Tsar was Maria's son, Prince Ivan, a 15-year-old boy, half-blind and disabled. The Narushkin supported Natalia's son, Peter, healthy and clever, but only 10 years old. An hour after Fyodor's death, the Boyars Council, with the support of Patriarch Joachim, declared Prince Peter to be the new Tsar of Russia. His mother's family, the Narushkins, seemed to have won the day. For those at court, it meant one Boyar family was out and another was in. But for one person, it spelled the ruin of all their dreams. Chapter 2, Sofia Alexeyevna. Sofia Alexeyevna aspired to what most young women aspire to, freedom, happiness, love. 
but her fate was not that of any ordinary woman. She was a Russian princess, daughter of Tsar Alexei, sister of the late Fyodor. In 1682, nine princesses lived in the Tsar's palace. They were Anna, Tatiana, Yevdokia, Martha, Sofia, Yekaterina, Maria, Feodosia, and Natalia. None were permitted to marry. No Russian man was of sufficient rank, and foreigners did not share their orthodox faith. The princesses spent their lives in their chambers, in strict isolation from outsiders. They only left the palace for church or other important ceremonies. In their carriages, they sat behind closed curtains, and if they went anywhere on foot, they were shielded from public gaze by drapes held up by their attendants. Their only amusements were the swings of the palace park in summer, sledging in winter, and performances by the court musicians. Their lives were devoted to family, worship, and decorum. Princesses finished their education at the age of 10. They were taught to read and write, arithmetic, and theology. But Sophia begged her father to let her continue to study alongside her brother, Fyodor. Their teacher, Simeon Palotsky, remembered her as curious and clever, and that she studied philosophy, theology, rhetoric, Polish, and Latin. She read widely, and even wrote her own plays. Sophia's heroine was Pulcheria, a 5th century Byzantine princess who'd ruled as regent for her younger brother. It was what Sophia dreamed for herself, her brother, Tsar Fyodor, had occasionally listened to her advice, but no more. His death gave Sophia a long-awaited chance. Sophia was counting on her disabled brother Ivan becoming Tsar. Then she could become the Russian Pulcheria and rule for him as regent. But the Narushkins were about to thwart this plan by placing Peter, not Ivan, on the throne. So, Sophia decided to intervene. Her plan centered on the Streltsy, the musketeer units that were the core of the Russian standing army. There were 26 regiments, 22 and a half thousand men, stationed in Moscow. Their privileges included not having to pay taxes and being allowed to carry out private business when not on active service. A private soldier was paid between three and five rubles a month equivalent to between 600 and 1,000 US dollars today. An officer was paid four times as much, between 15 to 20 rubles a month, while a colonel made between 30 and 60 rubles. Some unscrupulous colonels dipped into their soldiers' wages to augment their own pay. Streltsy wages were paid irregularly and late. Officers not only skimmed off some of their soldiers' pay, they sometimes made them work like serfs on their own estates. Streltsy had been pushed to breaking point. A situation Princess Sophia planned to use to her advantage. Meanwhile, the Narushkin's most able supporter, Artemon Matveyev, had just returned to Moscow from exile. This news persuaded Sophia to act without delay. Her supporters told the Streltsy that the Narushkin's had poisoned Tsar Fyodor and strangled his son, Prince Ivan. At the insistence of Patriarch Joachim, Princes Ivan and Peter, both perfectly well, were shown to the public. But the Streltsy were out for blood. They broke into the palace, looking for the Narushkins and their supporters. Prince Ivan hid in a corner, while Prince Peter clung to Artemon Matveyev. The Streltsy pushed the young prince aside and dragged Matveyev away. A servant of the Patriarch witnessed the revolt and later described the scene. Artemon Matveyev was hacked to pieces. Boyar Yuri Dolgorukov was dragged behind the gates and stabbed to death. The next day, his body was also cut into pieces. The Streltsy ransacked the treasury and entered the Tsar's chambers with weapons, looking for Boyar nobles to kill. They smashed down a door to the Patriarch's chambers and threw his steward from the window where he hanged from the end of a rope.
The Streltsy Revolt traumatized young Peter. He would neither forget nor forgive. The massacre lasted for three days. The victims included prominent Narushkin supporters, including two of Prince Peter's uncles, two government ministers, the Tsar's personal doctor, and about 100 others. May 19th, the Streltsy demanded outstanding wages totaling 240,000 rubles. On May 23rd, they presented a new ultimatum. The two princes, Ivan and Peter, should sit on the throne together. Finally, on May 29th, they made their final demand. Princess Sophia was to become regent until Peter was of age. Russia had its Princess Pulcheria. Sophia was playing with fire. Just six weeks before, Peter had been proclaimed Tsar, and the Streltsy had sworn allegiance to him. Now they had butchered his close relatives and handed power to her. The princess had used armed men to clear her path to power. She wasn't the last to do so in Russia, but she went down in history as the first. The new princess regent realized her position was extremely precarious and moved quickly to shore up her support. First, she ordered the payment of all outstanding debts to the Streltsy, even melting down some of the Tsar's silverware to meet the cost. Then Sophia gave all the key posts to her allies. The ambassador's department, which handled foreign affairs, was given to her favorite, Count Vasily Galitsyn. Streltsy, writer cavalry and great treasury departments, effectively control of the army as well as state finances, were given to Count Ivan Kovansky, nicknamed the Windbag. Kovansky, a veteran general and favorite of the Streltsy, soon realized that his new position gave him almost unlimited power, a temptation he could not resist. So began the Kovanchina, the bloody summer of 1682, when power in Moscow resided with Kovansky and his Streltsy troops. The Russian capital had been occupied by its own army. Princess Sophia had unleashed a dangerous power struggle that threatened to topple Russia into anarchy. Thankfully, the Streltsy were not the only military force in Russia. Now, she would turn to the nobles. On the day of the Feast of the Transfiguration, Princess Regent Sophia left the Kremlin under the guise of visiting the Donskoy Monastery, just across the Moscow River. But instead, she left the city and made for the Monastery of Trinity St. Sergius, where she planned to take refuge. From the safety of the monastery, Sophia sent letters across the land condemning this new Streltsy revolt and summoning all loyal nobles to her aid. By the end of the 17th century, the nobleman's army or militia totaled 14 and a half thousand men. This amounted to 10% of the army. These men had received their lands in exchange for military service. Each year, they were expected to turn out for review mounted on their own horse, equipped with their own arms and accompanied by several armed serfs. They were obligated to join the army on campaign whenever required. The main part of the army, 77,000 men or 50%, the so-called regiments of the new order. These were Reiter, Dragoon and Hussar cavalry units, made up mostly of foreign mercenaries. The troops now in revolt, the Streltsy musketeers, made up 35% of the army. Time was running out for Kavansky. His arrogant behavior had made him many powerful enemies. The Princess Regent's agents caught him in a tavern 
and brought him to their mistress outside Moscow. He was pushed to his knees before the princess regent, read his crimes of treason and mutiny, and beheaded. His position as head of the Streltsy department would go to Fyodor Shaklaviti, Sofia's new favorite. The Streltsy revolt was over. The princess regent returned to Moscow and took residence in the Kremlin with Tsar Ivan. While Peter, regarded as the junior Tsar, moved to the palace of Priyavrzhenskia. Village of Priyavrzhenskia covered an area of 22 desiatinas, or 24 hectares. A wooden palace had been built there 20 years earlier and was the furthest royal residence from the Kremlin. Moscow's foreign quarter lay between the Kremlin and the palace. At Priyabrezhenskoya, the young Tsar Peter devoted himself to war games, forming the local boys into so-called toy regiments. They would one day grow up to become the famous Priyabrezhensky Guards Regiment. A fragile balance was achieved with Tsar Peter and his mother living at their country palace and Sofia and Tsar Ivan living in the Kremlin. A double throne was made for the joint rulers with a small window at the back. During audiences with foreign ambassadors, advisors whispered to the young Tsars through the window, telling them what to say. Peter was clever but still young, while it was much harder for his half-brother Ivan. Like many of the children from Tsar Alexei's first marriage, Ivan suffered from poor health, possibly linked to scurvy, leaving him weak and lethargic. He also had some form of intellectual disability and was almost blind. These severe health issues left him with little enthusiasm or interest in governing the state. So Princess Regent Sophia ruled with the help of her favorite and lover, Vasily Galitsyn, who now bore the grand title, guardian of the Tsar's great seal and the state's great ambassadorial affairs. With Sophia's backing, Galitsyn worked out a breathtaking program of reform that was 150 years ahead of its time. Its starting point was the abolition of serfdom. But such radical ideas were impossible to realize at that time. Any attempt to free the serfs would have triggered a wholesale revolt of the nobles. Contemporaries called Vasily Galitsyn the Great. He favored Western-style reforms, spoke five languages fluently, was a superb diplomat, and had a great breadth of knowledge. What's more, he was said to be the most handsome man in Moscow. Sofia was completely in love with him and wrote to him almost every day. In her letters, she told him how she prayed for his good health and urged him not to exhaust himself with endless work. Her gratitude, she wrote, was impossible to express. Without him, none of her achievements would have been possible. Galitsyn urged Sofia to continue her brother Fyodor's reforms, but she never fully grasped the need for such changes. What's more, she faced stubborn opposition from the Boyar nobles. Nevertheless, it was Sofia who opened Russia's first institute of higher education, the Slavonic Greek Latin Academy, based on the institute founded by Fyodor. Its first professors were two Greek brothers, both of them renowned scholars. A degree took 12 years. The main disciplines were Greek, Latin, grammar, rhetoric, philosophy, and theology. The academy was situated in the buildings of the Zykona Spassky Monastery. Today, it is the site of the Russian State University for the Humanities. The academy later spawned the Lamanosov Moscow State University the Russian Academy of Sciences and the Moscow Theological Academy. In 1686, negotiations began with Russia's western neighbor, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. 
Galitzin led a series of long and grueling discussions, which eventually led to the signing of a Treaty of Eternal Peace in Moscow. This bound the kingdoms of Princess Regent Sophia and King Jan Sobieski in alliance, and was to prove the crowning achievement of Russian foreign policy in the 17th century. Russia's gains included the regions around Smolensk and Chernigov, as well as parts of eastern Ukraine and the cities of Zaporozhye and Kiev. The Treaty of Eternal Peace contained one additional clause. Russia was to join the Holy League, a military alliance against the Turkish Ottoman Empire. This obliged Russia to go to war against the Crimean Khanate, an Ottoman ally. But Galitsyn was not in favor of war and wanted to delay as long as possible. Despite his misgivings, Sofia placed Galitsyn in charge of the army for the forthcoming campaign. She dreamed of great victories that would unite Russia behind her and cover her beloved Galitsyn in glory. No sooner had he left for the front than Sofia began to write to him. In her letters, she called Galitsyn by his pet name, Vashenka, and worried endlessly about his safety. It was only when she embraced him with her own arms, she wrote, that she would know peace again. In May 1687, a 100,000-strong Russian army joined forces with Don and Zaporozhye Cossacks and advanced towards the Isthmus of Perekop. They found the fields had all been burnt, leaving no food for the horses. Some said it was the Cossacks, not the enemy, who burnt the land, in fear of Russia's growing power. The campaign was cut short. The next year, an even bigger Russian army advanced south. The war's only battle was fought on May 15th, after which the Tatars retreated and the Russians advanced to Perekop. When the news reached Sofia in Moscow, she was ecstatic. Her letters back to Galitsyn overflowed with love and adulation and longing for the day they would be reunited. Galitsyn, however, could advance no further. In fact, he was already on his way back to Moscow. The scorched earth tactics of his enemy had starved his army of food and water leading to the loss of half his men, even though there had been no major battles. The campaign was, in fact, a complete disaster. Galitsyn's role in this catastrophic defeat would not be forgotten. Later, when he was sent into exile, one of the main charges against him would be his ruinous handling of the Crimean campaign. On the eve of the debacle, he suffered the worst blow of all, the betrayal of his beloved. While Galitsyn was away fighting, Sofia had fallen for another man, the cynical and scheming Fyodor Shaklovity. To flatter Sofia, he had brought the famous Ukrainian artist Alexander Tarasevich to Moscow to paint her portrait. He depicted the princess wearing a regal crown, scepter in hand, and behind her, a double-headed eagle. Sophia adored it. She ordered the portrait to be engraved in copper, so copies could be printed and sent to all the courts of Europe. By now, Sophia was styling herself by the grace of God, the great sovereign lady, the pious Tsarevna, the great princess Sofia Alexeyevna, autocrat of the great, the little, and the white Russias. At state ceremonies and ambassadorial receptions, she no longer felt the need to stand at a respectful distance behind the Tsar's throne. It was said her inspiration was the English queen, Elizabeth I. As soon as Tsar Ivan turned 18, Sofia arranged his marriage to the 20-year-old Praskovia Saltikova. 
Sofia was counting on the birth of a male heir to cement the Miloslavsky branch of the Romanov dynasty in power. The rival Narushkin branch had, of course, had the same idea. Peter was not quite 17 when his mother, the dowager Zaritza Natalia, married him off to the 19-year-old Yevdokia Lapukina. She was neither clever nor educated, but healthy. The outcome of these marriages would shape the future of the Romanov dynasty for generations to come. Ivan and Praskovia had five daughters, but only three survived infancy. Yekaterina, Anna and Praskovia. Anna later became Empress of Russia. Yekaterina's daughter Anna Leopoldovna became regent for the young Ivan VI, but he was the last male of the romanov miloslavsky line. Peter and Yevdokia had three sons, but only the eldest, Alexei, lived. His son became Emperor Peter II, but he was the last male of the romanov narushkin line. On May 30th, 1689, Tsar Peter came of age. Sophia was now supposed to step down as regent, but she had no intention of giving up power. Instead, Shaklaviti began spreading false rumors amongst the Streltsy regiments, claiming that the Narushkins planned to assassinate Sophia and Tsar Ivan and send the Streltsy away to garrison remote fortresses. The Streltsy were unhappy, but would not risk open revolt. Then, Shaklaviti let it be known that those who joined his conspiracy would be paid. Two rubles for each private, 10 for each officer, 100 for each colonel, plus the right to plunder the houses of their victims. Moscow was on a knife edge. On the night of August 7th, loyal Streltsy officers arrived at Peter's palace. They told him that Shaklaviti was planning to use the Streltsy to murder Peter and his family. Peter reacted with horror and outrage. Before fleeing to safety, he wrote a letter to Ivan, his brother and joint ruler. Our sister, Princess Sophia, runs our country as she wills. Bandits like Shaklaviti and his friends plan to murder us and our mothers. Now, Brother Tsar, we shall rule our country on our own, since we are both men. Our sister has nothing more to do with it. It is shameful, Tsar, to be men and to have someone else rule in our place. That evening, Princess Sophia received a report that Peter's palace at Priyabrazhenskoye was empty. Tsar Peter, his mother, pregnant wife, and entire court had left for the monastery of Trinity St. Sergius. His so-called toy regiments, now composed of young men, followed him there, together with one loyal Streltsy regiment. Rumors began to fly around Moscow. Everyone was on edge, but quickly, the mood began to turn against Sofia. August 13th, Sofia sent an emissary to Peter, Boyar Ivan Troyokurov, but the young Tsar would not negotiate. August 16th, Boyar Peter Prazorovsky visited the monastery with the same result. August 20th, Sofia begged Patriarch Joachim to visit Peter. He went, but did not return. He stayed with Peter. Boyars, officials, and even Streltsy began to flock to Peter's rival court. August 27th, Sofia left to negotiate with her brother in person. She realized that she shouldn't, that her humiliation would likely be in vain, but she could not simply sit and wait. Six miles from the monastery, near the spot where she had had the Streltsy leader Kovansky executed seven years before, she was met by Troyokurov, her own emissary from just two weeks ago. He handed her Peter's order to turn back. August 31st, Sofia returned to the Kremlin, where she gathered the Streltsy in the square. She told them that Peter's advisors sought to divide them by inventing plots against Peter's life, but that she was confident of their loyalty to her. But her speech made little impact. 
Only loyal Shaklaviti remained by her side. September 4th, the foreign regiment under General Gordon went over to Peter's side. September 6th, Streltsy arrested Fyodor Shaklaviti and took him to Peter for sentencing. September 7th, Vasily Galitsyn came to see Peter. The Tsar refused to meet him and sent him into exile. September 8th, the title of Tsarevna, royal princess, was officially stripped from Sofia. September 9th, Troya Kurov informed Sofia of the Tsar's will. She was to enter the monastery of Novodevichy and remain there for the rest of her life. September 12th, Shaklaviti was beheaded by the main road outside the Trinity Monastery. October 16th, the Tsar's court, boyars and army returned to Moscow and Peter I took up the reins of government. His elder brother, Ivan V, remained joint ruler, taking part in ceremonies when his strength allowed. But his health continued to decline. Soon, Ivan found it difficult to walk and was almost completely blind. He died seven years later, on February the 8th, 1696, aged just 29. Princess Sophia lived under guard in a tower of the Novodichi Monastery. She received food from the Tsar's table, as well as an allowance of 2,600 rubles a year, the same as the other royal princesses. A small staff of servants lived with her, an old nanny, two clerks and nine maids. For nine years, Sophia lived quietly in the monastery, reflecting on her years of power and the fate of her two lovers, one executed, the other exiled to the north. But she also continued to intrigue, exchanging secret letters with her supporters. In June 1698, Peter was in Holland learning to build ships. But back home, poor treatment led 4,000 Streltsy to kill their officers and march on Moscow, intending to restore Sofia to the throne. They were met by government troops, the Priobrzezhensky Regiment, the Semenovsky Regiment, the Lofortov Regiment, the Foreign Regiment under General Gordon and the Nobles Militia under General Shane. The Streltsy were defeated at New Jerusalem, 30 miles from Moscow, and reprisals began. General Shane conducted the initial investigation. He had 130 Streltsy hanged, 140 whipped and sent into exile, and 1,960 banished to remote regions. But in August, Peter returned to Moscow and renewed the investigation. He had another 2,000 Streltsy executed and 600 more flogged and branded. Streltsy corpses were hung from the walls of the Kremlin and Sofia's residence, the Novodevichy Monastery. Streltsy property was plundered, and even the 16 regiments that didn't take part in the revolt were disbanded. Princess Sophia was forced to take the veil under the name of Susanna. Boyars close to her were interrogated and then banished to distant monasteries. Her allowance was slashed, her staff changed and security tightened. The bodies of three Streltsy hung by the window of her cell for five months. She had struck terror at court, won the favor of any man she wanted, held the power to invoke and quell revolts, waged wars, and concluded brilliant peace treaties. She dreamed of becoming a real ruler, like the Byzantine princess Pulcheria, whose tale had captivated her as a child. She had defied all the odds to make her dream a reality, 
becoming the first Russian princess to escape her secluded existence, the first to live life and wield power. But in the end, her downfall was complete. For seven years of rule, she spent 15 years in a monastery cell. She died in 1704, aged 46, and was buried in the cemetery of the Novodevichy Monastery. By the time of her death, great changes were sweeping over the country she had once ruled. Changes that would transform Russia forever. The history of the old Russian state was at an end. The history of a new Russian empire was beginning. <laughs>